Yo, what up? Welcome to another episode of the Open Warriors Podcast. I'm Patrick, and I am, once again, joined by my friend, Aram in Toronto. What's up, Aram? Hello. It's nice <laughs> to be here. It's summer in Canada. We get about two months of summer, so I'm already enjoying it. What's the temperature outside? Um, it is, it's actually kind of cold right now. It's, uh, it's like 19 degrees Celsius. So whatever that's like 68 degrees or something like that, but it's normally much hotter than that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, comfort in terms of temperature is all relative, right? And I, and I'm in the basement and I'm wearing a fleece. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, so it's a little cold. It's I'm not here- normally like this in July, but. Yeah, I'm here in California and I'm sweating, so leave it at that. Um, but but it's been a couple of weeks since we talked, and I wanted to catch up with you about the NBA draft. We talked right after the lottery, and we've had some time to decompress, uh, read some of the chatter, uh, ignore some of the other chatter, and uh, you know, I kind of I kind of want to talk and see where you're at on some of these prospects now that uh, I think we're each a little bit more familiar with them. Um, And I propose we kind of just, you know, look at who is realistically within range for the Warriors at seven and 14. And of course, we're just going on the assumption that they're going to keep these picks and who we think could fall in here. So we're not going to say, Kate Cunningham, uh, Scotty Barnes, even, you know, Mobley. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems it seems a lot of people have a, have agreed or speculated that there's a top six, you know, who, you know, maybe somebody sneaks into that top six and it pushes one of those top six down. But I don't think it's, you know, and I think if that were the case, any of those top six would be like, yeah, get that guy. But um, kind of don't really see it happening you know uh usually when there's that much smoke there is a fire right um Mm -hmm. but that said you never know uh things can happen they can fall in love with a prospect and there can be trades and and whatnot but it's probably not that useful to talk about trades because that could just be a a million different uh a a million different threads that that could go in different directions but i i'm super excited to talk about these prospects and you know still learning about them um and also you know uh we talked a couple weeks ago right after the lottery and it's been some time to reevaluate my Chris Duarte take. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't think they'll take him at 14, which I think I said. <laughs> I, I definitely was thinking that too. And I actually don't think I feel that way anymore. Um, but, but it's very, it's very fluid. There are like, I, I yeah. mean, there, if, if there is a consensus, it seems like from seven, like downward over the next 10, 15 picks, like there's a lot of fluidity. So, um, you know, Chris Duarte is not totally out of that conversation. No, 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 no. Um, He, he still is pretty solid, but let's get at some of these prospects. So what we'll do is just go back and forth. We have our own list here of, uh, of dudes that might fall in this range and dudes that have been talked about a lot. So, we're just going to go back and forth and then talk about what we like about them and what we don't like. You know, I'm going to let you start. You're going to pick your favorite out of uh, oh. this, this crew. So, okay. Oh, it's my like favorite. a game show. Oh man. I didn't know I was going to go first. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to go with James Booknight because uh, not that he's my favorite aesthetically, but he is a bucket getter. And I think that that's something that could use. I don't think it's a, issue of duplicating too much of what Jordan Poole does. Cause if you can have two dudes that do similar things, then you have two guys that do similar things and you can do it together. Will he get, get to the free throw line? Um, that's useful in a second unit. Um, and, and I think he has higher upside than Jordan Poole and, and you've seen him speculated as possibly rising. You know, he had a great shooting display at the, at the pro day, you know, maybe that some of that is uh spin in terms of like, Oh, his percentages weren't good because sh- he had a shoulder injury, but you know, regardless, if you can score, you can score. Um, and that was a problem at times with last year's team. I think they had something like the 20th ranked 
offense or it was somewhere in the in the twenties, right? And that's a problem. Mm-hmm. It needs to get higher. It needs to get to ten or so. Mm-hmm. Um, so I this is a this is a player that has upside, um, can probably come in and score. For that reason, I think that he's a he's an intriguing prospect for them. I don't know. What do you think about Book Knight? Oh, I love Book Knight, man. I mean, like his percentages aren't great, but I think he can shoot well enough that that can improve. And I'm with you, like as a dude who can get a bucket anytime, pretty much mid range, uh, get to the rack, get fouled, free throws, all that stuff. We saw how hard it was for anyone else on this team, on this Warriors team, to score, and it's. For a team that dominated for so long since the 2019 NBA Finals where everyone was out and injured and they were boxing, wanting Steph, it's like yeah. ever since then it's felt like they didn't have enough dudes scoring. And I would love to bring in somebody who could do that. He, he's, he's like tall, you know, he's taller than Jordan Poole. And if you throw out Brook Knight, Poole, Wiseman, Wiggins, I don't know, any combination – in the second unit or whatever, then, I mean, Poole can handle the ball. I mean, Book Knight's yeah, not bad. Yeah. So I think, like, just as somebody who can score, he he's solid. I would not mind at all if if they if they took him. I think he could contribute in the in the regular season. And, um, yeah. you know, I mean, what, like his, his comps, what, like CJ, CJ McCollum? Yeah. You know, yeah. and a taller CJ McCollum? I'll take that. Yeah, definitely with a seventh pick. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, uh, Jamal Murray light. I'll take that too. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. you kidding me. And I, and I do think the shot will get better too. You know, like the, the, the shot will get better. People who can score, they, they work on that. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that it's going to get higher. Yeah. He, he's up there for me. Uh, uh, if they keep this pick, I'm going right. to take a shot at, uh, I'll take Moses Moody. Okay. Um, he's a 3 and D guy, and I think the fact that he can actually score, they need guys who can shoot uh, when they double, triple team Steph. And even if he's not the quickest dude and you know he's not much of a slasher yet, like I think guys who can hit the wide open shot and also play defense, you know, like he would be – helpful right away you know i mean if you look at the warriors last season who was somebody like that like the six three michael Mulder. <laughs> yeah you know like uh i mean luckily he had long ass arms uh so you know his defense was okay for you know a g leaguer who was like eighth man in a uh eight man rotation you know so i think moody would uh like be actually really helpful, you know, and hell, if you imagine a future with him, Wiseman and whomever else like Poole or whoever else they draft, you know, you could see that maybe working out into a nice like system, you know, a guy who can uh, play defense, uh, isn't uh, outsized for the wing and, um, you know, and can, and can drill threes. If he can drill threes like next season, awesome. If, and uh, I just assume he'll get better and better at that. I mean, those are two skills that, like, if you want somebody who could probably help a little bit right away in terms of the regular season, um, and somebody who has like a high-ish ceiling or higher than maybe like a, a Duarte or a Kispert, then yeah, you know, I would totally take Moody and his amazingly long arms. Yeah, yeah. I I mean he. There definitely seems to be uh, a concern that it's like a, a lower ceiling than than some of the other prospects. But um, but if he's Michael Bridges, um, you know, um, what's Delon? What's the Delon Wright's brother that played for the Warriors? What was Darrell that? Wright. Darrell Wright. You know, like these are these are guys that you know play for a decade, um, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. and that's definitely useful you know at the seven pick like i kind of would like to make a little bit bigger swing uh Mm -hmm. for higher upside but at 14 um i don't know we're not talking about the picks per se but absolutely like at 14 moses moody would be interesting um 
like the defense looks like it will come um the crazy long arms which is really nice a little less bouncy than michael bridges but um but looks like a you know really nice shot form so definitely definitely interested in that if, if he's like a, a poor man's chris middleton a very unspectacular uh but solid yeah. and a very very uh, effective uh game then uh then i will i will take that that was that was the other com i mean that's a little bit more about like kind of like body size and body mechanics but like yeah uh chris middleton i is like would be an amazing ceiling uh for moses moody i'm good with moses moody too okay all right um i don't want to talk about my next one would be josh giddy thinking about upside right sure and um when you think about an nba player who has an elite skill right any anything is your elite skill um and his is he does he he's uh his parents were uh professional athletes his dad played basketball um so he sees the game he sees passes he reads it really well for you know 18 19 year old kid um the shot definitely needs work um the strength has already been developing apparently he's he's put on weight since their season ended or since he started training for the draft. So that's encouraging. And he's got really good size. So, um, you know, they, they always, they often talk about that, um, you know, shooting is one of those things that does develop over time, but what are you bringing to the table with you already, right? Whether it's your elite athleticism, is it your elite in this case passing? Um, and that's such an important aspect of the warriors offense and you know i think there's debate about whether uh the Kerr offense needs to change but no matter what passing is still going to be playable in any system right so uh so in that respect i mean i i i worry it's a little bit of a uh that it might be like oh uh we better pick the next guy from australia then you know who played yeah. you know, nbl I, I i worry a little bit about that but um but he does seem legit and and i think he's in play for seven to be honest yeah i mean i i don't know much about giddy everything i've heard i mean the size and the passing that's really enticing i don't think um i mean right like at his age like the shooting isn't there just yet and I don't think he is the most athletic, so defensively I'd worry about him. He would definitely be like a project. And if we're going with the mindset that we've talked about before of like, you know, taking uh, somebody who could maybe help now and then taking a quote unquote swing for the fences, this would be the the swing uh, for you then. Because it could go like either way. I mean, I, again, I haven't seen enough of him, but um they do need ball handling and they do need size. But, yeah. Uh, and and yeah. I think the passing might be able to play right away. So the, the yeah. passing and the size, and I mean, we're not talking about like 30 minutes a, a night, but it's like a, you know, uh, well, I want 30 a minutes ten, a night. A ten, these guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're we're going to be in trouble if that's the case. Um, uh, but a, you know, a 10, a 10 to 15 minute a night thing, may, maybe some, yeah. you know, some DNPs, but, uh, but I, I think, you know, the passing and moving the ball will help, especially if you think about like, let's say they're in a second unit and, uh, you know, it's pick and roll with Wiseman or mm -hmm. um, Jordan Poole, you know, like, like that kind of thing. Ball movers are useful in that situation. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Who is left here? Okay. I'm not going to go with somebody that I think like should be the seventh pick or whatever. I'm just going with somebody I like. Maybe with a 14th pick, who knows? But I want Zaire Williams. I uh, knew it. I knew it. I, 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 I'm calling him out before you ever get a chance. <laughs> but, uh, like, I've been a fan of that kid since, you know, last season. And I think he's the swing for the fences guy that I would take just because, I mean, he's not going to help next season. He's super skinny, still pretty raw, but he has all the tools. And he, before this weird ass COVID season where a lot of weird stuff happened to everybody, Stanford's team in particular, he was going to be good, you know? And then just one aberration season, 
I don't want to pass up on like Jaden McDaniels, you know, I don't want to pass up on like this six, nine, six, 10 dude, uh, who can defend, who can shoot it. Okay. And, you know, can handle the ball, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. so I would be like, if they took him at 14, I would be more than happy to take any one of these older dudes. <laughs> <at number seven. laughs> Even somebody like, I don't want that you know, we'll probably talk about in the next few minutes. Yeah. So give me yeah. Zary Williams. I, 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 I would love that at, at, at 14. There's almost like no downside to taking somebody at that point, right? Like if the, mm-hmm. if the Nuggets had taken Michael Porter Jr. and it didn't work out, nobody would be like, oh, you know what I mean? I mean, some, some Warriors Twitter people might be because they complain about the, you know, the 29th pick not working out. But like, but this is the, this is a great time to take somebody like that who is the kind of like post hype, um, post hype player. Like, just like you said, that last season affected these young people uh, in ways that we can't evaluate. Um, mm-hmm. So, look at the work before that and the trajectory that was happening in high school. And there's a reason why he was a top ten prospect, right? There's a reason mm-hmm. why at the beginning of this year he was considered in, you know. Um, maybe like the numbers, you know, he would be like the number seventh pick or something like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Sure. Maybe like there are other things that happen throughout the year. Maybe his work habits weren't good, but you know, that's where uh, all the front offices are going to be really having to make their money in evaluating um, what, what these players went through and come on, my judging and judging their (laughs) development. (laughs) Yeah. You always, you always Mike. Um, so I, I I would love that pick. I mean, super high upside. Again, like there's a reason why he was so highly touted. So, um, and that's why we have all these new coaches for. So uh, I would yes. love that pick. Uh, not at seven, obviously, and nobody's thinking that it would be seven. But yeah, um, but I could see it. I could see it happening at fourteen. I would I would love that. I would be super um, excited. You know, like yeah. Uh, just I mean, we talked about this before. Just like homegrown talent and just like potential, because in the past we just always, always passed on potential for like Todd Fuller. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> who I yeah. just keep mentioning. I can't stop mentioning that dude. <laughs> <laughs> it's just stuck. It's just yeah. it, It's it's a pain that never goes away. Okay, uh, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Um, Davion Mitchell and my hot take is the Warriors will not draft Davion Mitchell. That's my okay, okay. Lock, why, stock, why, why? smoking gun. Okay, why? and it's just and it's just based off of what I think Bob Myers and the Warriors team like. They have never drafted somebody this short before, mm. or and and never drafted anybody with such short arms. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> like even even the short dudes that they got recently i mean who are scrub players uh wanamaker had long arms uh michael Mulder had long has long arms so Nico Mannion like, doesn't that's true but he was also the 48th pick or whatever right right, right. Um, so i just i just don't see them drafting mitchell um that said uh if they did I think it would be interesting um, having somebody who could be a really, uh, really put pressure on the ball, really get up into guys, um, into those like, you know, premium scorers, be a nuisance, be that Patrick Beverly type. Um, That would be useful. I don't, I I don't, I'm not sure how much he could play with, uh, with Steph, but Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe he can play up. I, I mean, um there is there is the tendency to get fixated on measurements and and not think you know not talk enough about like can the guy play or not and and he definitely uh will have a role and he can play um is the shot gonna is the shot gonna be consistent uh that's a that's probably his biggest swing thing because like his his kind of like elite skill will will be like defending, right? Mm-hmm. You know, on on ball defender, but 
what else can you develop? So, but, but the size thing is an issue. Uh, the size yeah. thing is something that the Warriors have never done. So uh, that's why I feel like they will not draft him, despite all a lot of these mock drafts thinking that yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Davion Mitchell, if they do draft him, I will be disappointed. If they draft him seven, I'll be really disappointed. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where I agree that he will be able to contribute something next season you know like it'll be limited we'll see the effects of him being so short uh and i do also worry about the shot because you know everybody points at the free throw percentage it's like what 62 63 percent or something yeah you know? yeah it's pretty low uh, like <laughs> uh, shockingly low <laughs> yeah like really really low so either that's like a mechanics thing or that's a you know he has a something in his head which I don't know which one's worse, actually. I think the one in your head is worse. Um, but uh, yeah, like I'm, I'm not that high on him. Everybody says that the Warriors love him. And I, I don't know. I was like, oh man, I wish uh, all that is smoke, smoke and mirrors from the Warriors. But, you know, the Warriors are very like, they're, they, they wear their hearts on their sleeves, man. And they will not... <laughs> Do know, uh, you know, they don't seem like they do deception the way like Mike Shanahan and uh, Lynch uh, did for the Niners. So, yeah. like, I worry that all this chatter that we're hearing about how much the Warriors like Davion Mitchell, that it's really, really true. And I'm like, no, hopefully they love him just enough to take him at 14 then, because I, I don't want him at seven. You know, and hopefully, like, yeah. Draymond Green isn't like, you know, hey, I'm undersized. I like this guy. He's undersized. Yeah. You know? <laughs> that would be the worst. You know, hopefully Steph is like, no, I don't want to play next to a dude that's shorter than me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think he would contribute. Uh, it would be not the most exciting pick, but you know, it would be, uh, mm, it's yeah. not sexy. It's not sexy. Yeah. I, I would be like, oh, okay, well let's see what he can do. That's kind of how yeah. I would approach it. Yeah. I am going to talk Corey Kispert. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to see your uh, uh, contribute now, Davion Mitchell, and um, raise you a uh, sharpshooting Corey Kispert. Uh, Kispert, like if they took him, obviously 14 instead of seven, you know, like, again, I would be like, well, okay, well, let's see if he can shoot, you know? Uh, and he probably can, and he probably will. And, you know, obviously he probably doesn't have that, high of a ceiling but hey again just like moses moody if you need guys who are dead eye shooters who can cut um backdoor all that stuff do everything that the warriors need him to do in that respect then he'll help you know uh yeah. he will forever be a role player so if you're talking like a future of wiseman pool kispert like that's that doesn't inspire like oh that's that's a big three you know what i mean that's like, oh, wow, that's a Wiseman and a couple of role players or something, you know. Um, but again, if they decided to go like older college prospect and, you know, picked him up, I'd be like, OK, yeah. If they went Mitchell and Kispert, I would be like, yeah, at, at least uh, <laughs> at least we know what we're getting pretty much. Right. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I just hope that he doesn't get embarrassed on the defensive end. That's my biggest question. And um, I didn't watch him a lot in that, uh, but in that uh, game against Baylor, uh, he, he didn't look too comfortable getting like knocked around a little bit, but we'll see. We'll see. You know, and he's uh, what he measures out six, six in socks. So yeah. Uh, yeah. The know. measurables were, were, yeah. were solid. And, and the, the kind of like uh, athletic, measurables were slightly better than expected so yeah um it, yeah if he's again, a if he's a dead eye uh, shooter at a on a rookie contract that's that, that's cool yeah again it's not a sexy pick but shooting matters it really does and um if you are really that knockdown shooter that will add a lot to the spacing it will make everything easier for everybody else um and you know like when you heard Bogut talking about uh, Justinian Jessup, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Like it, 
you, you, he, he said, you can't leave him in the corner. Right. So it like, is, uh, Kispert going to be that kind of guy? Like you can't leave him, can't leave him. Uh, and if so, like that's super helpful. Um, again, it's not, it's not the, it's not the high upside, um, not the high upside play. I mean, I think all of this, like, I, I know we have a couple of guys left to discuss, but I, I mean, it all begs the question of like, um, what will their strategy be? Mm-hmm. Um, and what is their uh, plan for development? And what is their m- more like a development philosophy? Um, but uh, I don't know, maybe we, we can maybe we can speculate on that after we get I think we have a couple more guys to talk about. Yeah, that. I'm gonna talk about Keon Johnson. Okay, um, right. because I watch you know clips of him and and uh, and of course like in my mind I'm like ooh it's like looks like Spreewell you know but mm-hmm. with like mm-hmm. but with like Zach Levine hops um, yeah <clears throat> but just like like early Spreewell like super athletic way more athletic than Spreewell was um, but I don't I don't think. I don't think they'll take him. He just seems super raw. But I, I do like the kind of like uh, defensive tenacity. And that could be some like uh, that high motor, that high compete level, despite the skills being pretty rough. Mm-hmm. That could be appealing to them. Um, I mean, I it's like all of these dudes that we're talking about were all like, I'd be happy if they were 14. You know, but <laughs> yeah. none of it is none of it is like I'd be happy at seven. Um like none of them would I, I think James Book Knight might be the only one that I would uh, of of the people that we've talked about so far that I would be happy with at same, seven. Same, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So. Think about Keon Johnson, yeah, like everything I've heard and seen is that he's pretty raw and you know, this athleticism, it reminds me of like, you know, in the nineties and the odds early odds where like the Warriors had, after they got rid of Spreewell, they had no athleticism, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> they had, when they traded Spreewell, they had John Starks, Terry Cummings, and Chris Mills, right? <laughs> and, and then like when we got Larry Hughes, it was like, oh yeah, he's athletic. And he was okay. And then we yeah, got- Yeah, kind of glided, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he had some weird cadence to his game. And yeah. then we got Gilbert Arenas and Jason Richardson in the same year. And it was like, whoa, we got like athletes. Now we got guys who can dunk. Somebody can play against, you know, at least in my fanciful mind back then, Kobe Bryant, right? Yeah. There's our answer to Kobe. Um, although Gilbert was pretty good against Kobe when he left the Warriors. Yeah. But I look at Keon Johnson, I'm like, oh man, he's the kind of guy I would have fallen in love with in the draft in the 90s, right? Because it was like, oh, is that it's pure athleticism? But like you said earlier, man, you got to be able to shoot and his defense, uh, he gets after it and that'd be helpful. But again, like, I don't know if that's enough. Despite breaking the records for vertical and standing jump, he, he just doesn't like, that's it, right? That That's what everybody is going off of. I mean, he was always a candidate for late lottery, but beyond the fact of him jumping two and a half inches higher than the previous record 20 years ago, I haven't really heard or seen anything that makes me think like, oh yeah, he's, he should be the seventh pick. I don't even really want him at, at uh, 14, to be honest. I mean, considering like who else might, might yeah. be there, you know? I would agree with that. I, I, out of the, out of the kind of like top 15 players, it just seems like so far away. And I think he could be really good and pretty amazing, but uh, it just doesn't seem like they're, type of player either yeah 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 franz wagner okay what i like about wagner is that he's big he can pass he can shoot it okay um and apparently he can defend so he's serviceable right like mike dunleavy as we've talked about before must be looking at him as like my son i shall draft (laughs) you but mike dunleavy the third yeah yeah uh i i personally like if they drafted Wagner, I would it would to me feel like one of those old school unexciting picks where you're like, oh, he might help, he might not. You know, his ceiling is low. Um, 
He's not going to be like a breakout star. Uh, but he could make sense in Steve Kerr's system. And yeah. does that get me excited? <laughs> no. <laughs> like he might be like a younger version of what, jta was but with probably like less uh left less moxie and attitude but yeah. but that kind of like swiss army knife guy shoot a little bit pass a little bit rebound a little bit guard multiple positions like that's super useful yeah 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 so like, and younger I, too so maybe he'll become the 39 percent three nba three-point shooter maybe yeah i mean you figure if these dudes can shoot um a little bit that they would just, they know, they should know that they're going to make their money shooting and yeah. they should just really, really perfect all that stuff. But it's just like all these guys, man, it's like, it's like, oh, they're, they, they're good at this, but there's oh, not sure about that. And like, that's like you said, where the, um, the front office is going to have to figure it out. That's why it's tough. You look at that top six and you're just like, ah. Oh man yeah <laughs> you know, just be like i mean e even you know if by some chance like i mean i think kaminga might be the one who could fall like uh and if he did i feel like not that i know anything i'm not in these workouts but i feel like if he did you'd have to take him yeah yeah i would totally Take him. I would be furious if they didn't take him just as an asset and a potential trade yeah. chip if they wanted. Take him or see who knows. Maybe they would definitely get some phone calls if all of a sudden yeah. Kaminga dropped to seven and they had like five minutes to, to make a deal or whatever. Um, yeah. And but I would, I would, if they took. Kaminga at seven, I'd be like, take the oldest dude you want. Take Duarte at 14, which <laughs> wouldn't break my heart at all because you know, I still like Duarte yeah. to some extent. Yeah. But like, just take best player available, please, at that at that point. You know, yeah. It would be silly yeah. not to. My sleeper pick, and then, and I'm cheating because I want to talk about two. Um, my sleeper pick is, uh, hold on, let me find, is uh, Trey Murphy. Oh man, that's my sleeper pick. <laughs> uh, so who's okay. Garuba for you now? Um, uh, no, I mean Trey Murphy's pretty interesting, and I saw uh, some highlights of him. Um, he had like a late growth spurt, so like it, you, whenever you hear yeah. dudes like you're like, "Ooh, he has guard skills," you know what I mean? Yeah, he must. Yeah. Um, like really good size. He's had good workouts. Like. Uh, and and like having that kind of size on the wing, it's not just a Virginia comparison, but like a DeAndre Hunter, like that would be super helpful. You know, mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. a really useful player to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'm so mad you took my my guy there. I mean, like, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna surprise him with Trey Murphy. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, when you hear somebody like. Right, like just, I could name like five dudes who had the late growth spurt, you know, like Scottie Pippen, David Robinson, uh, Dennis Rodman, Anthony Davis. Um, okay, I can name four, <laughs> <laughs> but all of them, right? Like it's the guard skills, and especially nowadays, right? I mean, look at Pippen, man. You know, yeah. like that's what made him great that he could play point guard and he could pass yeah. at that yeah. size at six eight with those long crazy arms, and Anthony Davis too. Yeah, I would not mind him at all. I think uh, he's he'd be in a, an intriguing player. I think he, I mean, he's one of those dudes that like, oh man, it's too much of like a risk to take him high right now, you know? Maybe after workouts, if he works his way up, maybe at 14, you know, but yeah. uh, definitely not yeah. seven. I will say one thing, man, like some of these teams who are drafting later, um, in the draft, there's going to be some choice talent in the uh, late stages of the first round. Like dudes like, you know, Trey Murphy, uh, uh, you know, Josh Christopher, Duarte, Jared Butler, mm -hmm. if, he still, mm -hmm. if he gets to play, you know. Man, now I got to pick somebody. <sighs> okay, I'll give you a little bit of time. 
because I, yeah. I, I want to talk about this other guy. And I don't think it's somebody that I want per se, mm -hmm. but I'm so interested to see who's going to take him. And mm -hmm. I want to, and I'm so interested to see what he looks like in the league. And it's the Turkish kid. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll pair in Sengun. Mm -hmm. So interested to see, um, you know, you've heard all the comps like, oh, it's Ennis Cantor, back to the basket. But uh, you've seen like that. later in the season. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't want that either. But later in his season, he's playing more on the perimeter, like flashing more passing skills as like an 18 year old dominating like an uh, you know a, a good adult league professional league um i mean i'm so interested yeah. to see who's gonna take a risk on him and how what kind of situation he'll land in um and how will that maximize yeah. uh his talent i mean the defense is is a concern he doesn't move great but you know is he smart yeah he's a smart kid at 18 already you can see that on the offensive end he and uh you know so does he understand the game and can he work that into his the defensive side i mean there's a certain point where you know you can be the smartest player uh and, but your your physical traits just aren't gonna let it happen right um but i I mean, right, I don't know right. if I've talked about this before, but just like, yeah, Kavon Looney with offense like that. That could be good. <laughs> that could be good. Um, all right. Uh, who do I have? My dark horse. I feel like if I, I was going to pull Duarte out, but like he's not really a dark horse because we've talked about him so much. I'm going to go really, really, really like deep into the second round. This might not be a surprise. Uh, I'm going to call it BJ Boston. <laughs> I, knew it. I was looking at the late i was looking at the second round uh, uh, oh, he's gonna go bj go boston it's funny right because i talked to you about like my idea you know like <laughs> where if we take like somebody at seven who is very solid right like a, a mitchell or something like that and if they wanted to take a duarte oh they could trade trade back <laughs> and um you know get like a late first rounder maybe and then a second rounder and then you can yeah, take Duarte yeah. and then take uh pj boston but then you know you explained and other people online when i posted that places like, <laughs> it's not the nfl draft and it doesn't happen really much that way but i looked and the only team that has like a high second rounder and uh a mid to late first rounder uh are the knicks right they have 19 and they have 21, and they have 32, which is the second pick in the second round. And I'm like, would they? You know, they're, they might want to sneak up to 14, maybe? And, um, you know, but that was my thought. And, you know, BJ Boston, a uh, high school teammate of the also uh, maligned uh, Zaire Williams, <laughs> he was a prospect. You know, he's a lottery prospect and before the season. So, Again, he would be a he would be a project. Again, super skinny, and obviously, I would not take him fourteen. But he's somebody just in general who, after a couple of years, might be able to prove that he is on the right track. That he isn't just a a bust. You know what I mean? Like again, it must be weird to look at these kids, and then, like you're saying, like. You don't really know exactly how the strangeness of the season affected them, whether there was like tons of isolation, whether there was like some just homesickness because you had no one to talk to or because like you were living out of a hotel, um, et cetera. So, yeah, you know, like some people think BJ Boston sucks, but um, I think a team that takes a flyer on him might, if they have the right development team, uh, might have something, you know, eventually. I, I mean, I think this is really interesting development in terms of what they've already done so far. I think that the Wiseman experience from last year was a bit of a wake up call for them in terms of yeah. what do we need to build, build around young players, um, and maybe it was not just Wiseman. Maybe it's some of the other players too, that things that we don't know about. That was just the one that was most discussed in the most public. But 
because I, I I feel like in general in the NBA, um, you're hearing more talk about development, the importance of the right fit, and and not just like a, a culture fit for free agents and that kind of thing, but a culture fit for young players and um, mm-hmm. what what is giving them, and, and that's across the board. It's not just uh, you know teams. It's also that's the talk about you know the G League and all these other kind of. Um, you know, professional leagues that are coming up for young people, like what is giving them the best chance to succeed. And, and I, I think that the wise main experience, like, you know, when you look at it, aside from the injuries, which, you know, probably affected it more than anything. Um, at the same time, they didn't make uh, probably the right choices or they had missteps along the way for sure. Um, right. So, so, and then you see that they've hired you know, three new coaches that all have um, good experience and good res, good track record with player development. Um, mm-hmm. So you have, uh, you, have, you got Kenny Atkinson, you got Jama Malalela, and uh, Dejan Milo, Milo Yavik. Um, Thank and, you for pronouncing and... those so I don't have to. <laughs> I was giving it a shot. Um, and I, I'm super interested in these um, because yeah. because it's it's showing an inclination or it's showing signs about uh, how they're leaning with their player development philosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I and I think about like. Uh, and I and I know that like Lake pays attention to other uh, major league franchises in the Bay area. Like, cause I heard him on, on the comic comic podcast talking about the A's. Right. So he definitely mm-hmm. watches them. Right. But you know, and success in certain areas always brings attention. So I, I think the giants and what they're doing is, is pretty interesting in terms of their organizational philosophy and, and baseball is a different animal because like development, it happens over a much longer period, right? Like, I mean, mm-hmm. the NBA is probably quite unfair in that um, it expects players to excel very quickly. Um, when right. you see actually somebody like JTA can be developed over time, um, mm-hmm. they can, or Jay Crowder, or, you know, any of these kind of like, uh, kind of NBA middle-aged veterans who are super great con- contributors and, you know, they have to develop over time, but, but, you know, in baseball, that's built, that's the expectation. You very often, you know, very rarely uh, see somebody rise really quickly or go straight from high school to the pros or college to the pros. And, and what the giants are doing is, you know, they have very few stars uh, and the stars that they do have are old. So their organizational philosophy seems to be really focused on uh, depth and coaching and then also depth of coaching because they have like 15 15 major league coaches on the bench right so that <laughs> yeah. allow but that allows for uh, a really development focused uh, uh, and and almost like boutique uh, or bespoke uh custom approach to uh, uh I hate that word bespoke uh uh to to the, each of the players like development needs and Right. And that you see that that player development is working for older players and not just young players. It's like working for all of them. And so, so I'm, I'm curious to see uh, what these coaches can do. So, I mean, I'm curious, what do you think? Um, you know, they've hired these three new coaches, really impressive track records. Who do you think these coaches are for? For James Wiseman. Mm-hmm. I personally think they'll keep the seven and 14th picks and, and draft those guys. I think um, so too. I think that, you know, like you said, you don't want to get too much into like all this trade talk because a lot of it's just the hype machine trying to sell clicks and stuff. But like, I, I, I haven't heard any trades that I like for the Warriors uh, from my perspective. And if you don't find anything you like, draft a couple of dudes and then go into the season and then see if something comes up by the trade deadline. James Wiseman will be better. He can't be worse. He won't be worse. And if for some reason you see that he's not in your plans, or if a star becomes disgruntled, then you have three 
basic, basically lottery picks um, mm -hmm. that you can offer if you really wanted to. And with some of these development coaches, then maybe they'd actually be even better by then. So I personally think, I hope uh, my bias for homegrown talent and not trading as a knee-jerk reaction because like it's over this one month window where everybody's like, oh my gosh, you have to trade for Pascal Siakam. You know what I mean? I think that uh, it's for Wiseman, number seven, number 14. And to some extent, if they end up keeping him, Nico Mannion. Yeah, um, he's balling out for Italy. I mean, <laughs> he's dude, playing really he, well. <laughs> he's, he's an Olympian, right? Like there's another reason why I don't want uh, Davion Mitchell is because I'm still on Mannion Island. And I believe in that kid, you know, he's taller than Davion Mitchell, probably way weaker, <laughs> but like, uh, but, uh, you know, um, I mean, I, I think it's really smart and it is telling, right. That they looked at the organization from top to bottom where they want to go. And, you know, it wasn't like, Oh, it was your fault and you're getting fired, but you know, for different reasons on an individual basis, they realized they needed guys who could develop better, you know, like really develop. Not like, yeah. hey, you're one of the coaches on our staff. Why don't you become the guy who develops? I'm personally excited for that development uh, in terms of getting these coaches. And uh, like, I mean, as much as picking up players like this is exciting, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, the um, Jamal Malalela who was from the Raptor system, you know, the Raptors development pipeline is like really highly touted. You know, I don't actually follow the Raptors that much despite being here, but, you know, reading the beat writers uh, response to that, uh, Blake Murphy on the athletic was saying like, this is a huge loss for the Raptors. Um, yes. You, you know, yes. <laughs> suck it. Suck it Raptors. Um, uh, and then, and then it's interesting too, is just like you said, you know, uh, think about, the players that developed under Kenny Atkinson. And I'm sure that, you know, there were lots of coaches that were part of that development, but players who were, you know, not fringe players, but, but people who, who became uh, assets um, and good yeah. and, and more, moreover just became good players, right? Uh, Karis Levert or Dinwiddie. Jared Allen, uh, Dinwiddie. Yeah. Um, uh, Joe Harris. Like these are people who, who became really valuable to their team. Um, and then, and valuable in trades. So he's for Corey Kispert. <laughs> <laughs> so I also think that they'll keep seven and 14. It, it's uh, unless something blows them away. Um, and it's interesting that these uh, uh, Atkinson Malalela were uh, essentially, I think kind of lateral moves uh, from their mm -hmm. previous organizations uh, oh, as assistant coaches. So, so that, I mean, you know, ultimately like, well, that's, that's money talking, but still that that's interesting. And it shows a commitment to that. So still at the same time, it doesn't mean that, oh, just because they hired them, they'll keep seven and 14. It also may mean uh, that, you know, other players on, who are already on the roster can be developed as well. Yeah. So, yeah. but, it, and it also may mean uh, Smiley Geach will be on the roster in some way. <laughs> Had you heard of this uh, development coach in Toronto before? No, yeah. I hadn't heard the name before. Just, you know, it's just that their system is very, you know, you, you think about like Siakam and Fred Van Vliet, they all played in their uh, Raptors G League system and then, right. and other, other players too, like Boucher and. Um, yeah. 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 No, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, <laughs> intrigued by that and it gives like, us as fans something else to look forward to right because like uh it's like you know when we got steve kerr that was exciting and it was like in the 90s when they were firing coaches left and right and it was like oh maybe we can get phil jackson <laughs> <laughs> like that was what people were talking about you know um or somebody of value oh you know like dennis johnson you know, we went through this list of dudes. What combination of seven and 14 do you want? Oh, like, what is okay. your ideal scenario? All things being equal, no trades, you know, you and, don't know what's and nobody falling, nobody falling out of six. Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to need a second. You um, could also do um, like a couple combinations if you wanted. You know okay, what I mean? Like okay. there's something interesting about having two picks where you could like, you know, do two help now dudes or two swing for the fences or a combo, you know, like it's, that's, that's what's really fascinating about this. Like two picks that are so close together, but far enough apart. I think one combo I would like is uh, Giddy and um, and Zaire. Like okay. that was pretty. That was pretty interesting. I like that. I would also like uh, Book Knight and um, oh, if you could get Book Knight and Wagner, that'd be nice. I think that'd be really solid. I'm gonna say for my two. Uh, Here's the thing, like, <laughs> this is cheating because I think uh, Book Knight is both like a swing and also a help now. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, I agree. So, like, my ideal, oh man, like, I look at this and I'm like, you know, if they took, if they just went super safe and they went Mitchell and Kispert, like I said earlier, I'd be like, okay, well, you know what you're going to get. But, like, my, my ideal draft right now, as I look at this, like, would be Book Knight and Williams. Like I would love mm. that draft right now. Yeah, because I, I like I, that too. I feel like, um, like we were saying earlier, I think Book Knight could contribute. You could improve, and going into next season, not knowing what happens in free agency, assuming Ubre has gone, no matter what, uh, something we've been assuming for like the last six months. I feel like Book Knight can take pressure. Book Knight and Pool. Even if Book Knight's just playing 10 minutes, right? Like he can take pressure off clay. Maybe not on the defensive yeah. end, of course, but like um, just in terms of scoring and just being a, a two guard out there, I, I think he could help. And I think his ceiling, if it is, you know, something like, you know, CJ or, you know, <laughs> Jamal Murray, then go for it, you know? Like I feel like he would thrive with his ability to score at all three levels, even though it was three point shooting wasn't his percentage wasn't that great. Like, I feel like it'll improve. And I think him cutting him, like finding uh, spots the way clay does in the middle of uh, like the mid range. I and feel he like he moves be, without the ball really well too. Yeah. And I think that would be yeah. hugely helpful. And, you know, for all the reasons I said, Zary Williams before, I, I just like the potential in him. And if there's no pressure to play him or be, uh, you know, a 10, 15 minute per game guy yet. Oh man. The, okay. Just humor me. Like imagine if things go, not even like most ideal scenario, but even like reasonably, like the trajectory goes reasonably in a positive direction and everything stays as is. And, you know, you have young dudes, like you have pool Wiseman, uh, book Knight, and Zaire Williams. That would it's be exciting. nice, man. I would really, really be like, oh, shit. And then, of course, my man, uh, Nico Mannion. <laughs> <laughs> Orchestrating it all. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. Uh, the white Chris Paul. No. Uh, <laughs> um, it's about the same size. So that would be, personally, like, as, as of now, that would be my ideal draft as much as, like, so I'll look at somebody like Keon Johnson and, and um, I think, like, you know, yeah, athleticism, but I, I, I like Book Knight better. Um, K- Kispert, Moody. In terms of those guys, I like, I mean, not help now, but in terms of Moody, like, he has a lower ceiling than, than Zaire. And um, I would like to see this trifecta of development coaches get a shot at these guys, you know? And yeah. um, that would be phenomenal to me i do also want to just ask real quick like i i think we just have to address i don't want to make up trades but like i just want to get your thoughts on the siakam trade what's your take basically it's they're saying like uh siakam and uh maybe somebody else for basically wiseman wiggins number seven maybe number yeah. 14 but who knows it's a tough one because i do think that um I think they they do need high end help, like if they really want to go far, or or that uh, 
high-end help will help insulate against the variable that you don't know what clay is going to be. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like yeah. if clay comes back and plays like John Wall did, you know, in terms of relative to their old cells, like John Wall or Kevin Durant, then like you couldn't even tell Durant had an injury um, aside yeah. from his nagging injuries that he had. Yeah. But there's no, there's absolutely no assurance of that. Um, so, you know, a high end starter fringe all-star would really help ensure against that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it's worth giving up all of these assets for that because you better be really damn sure that that's going to work. And, you know, it's not a perfect fit and there's very rarely a perfect fit. I think that, you know, at, at his high end, um, he would be a great player on this team. I just don't know that it's worth uh, that. So it, you know, if it was Wiseman, Wiggins, 7, 14, you know, because I think you're without those assets, you're really then relying on uh, a mid-level player and then vet minimums to fill out your roster. And then, you know, dudes you already have, right? Yeah. Um, and that and that your high level talent is 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 going to be enough but i don't i don't know that it is um however my my uh my counter to that would be um so i, I would say so i don't think it's going to happen but i think my counter to that would be what i would consider much more uh doing it for or would give me more pause uh would be mm -hmm. uh Wiseman, Wiggins, uh, seven and fourteen for Siakam, and number four, and maybe, <laughs> like, and maybe, uh, and maybe uh, you know, I think the Raptors have like the the forty seventh pick or something like that, you know, um, and then maybe there's future draft considerations or something like. Um, and I'll even take Aaron Baines off your hands, right? Because then I'm not, <laughs> I'm not like losing the depth. I mean, that's a that's, I. Judging from your response, I <laughs> it sounds like a dream, like a ridiculous trade. But I think that you can't waste your assets like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I would do the trade you just mentioned. To, but like it's funny, right? Like I've read enough of uh, stuff on Twitter and in like comments from uh, Toronto fans, and like they would never give it. Like they just that would be the most lopsided trade to them. Right. Just the way, like, yeah. without the four, it's pretty lopsided to me um, to give up, you know, just for Siakam. And I, I agree with you, like, yeah, just giving up on Wiseman pennies on the dollar. And I've, I've, I, I've said this before, like, Wiggins, I mean, Pascal Siakam is a better player than Andrew Wiggins. That's not even a question. But, like, Wiggins' fit is proven. Um, he's healthier. Uh, he doesn't have like a shoulder issue, like right then and there, it just becomes way too much to give up. I think personally, like you need depth, you know, and yeah, yeah. I don't think Siakam is that guy, right. To give up all this stuff just for a short month. Cause you said it yourself, like once you give up all these assets, your team is pretty thin, right? Yeah. Like it's, 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 it's top heavy, but like, then you're again. You have Clay. I mean, it'll be a good team if everybody's healthy, right? And you yeah, just, maybe yeah. you'll get some ring chasers, and that's what they're hoping for if they do something like that. But I just personally wouldn't do it. I think. I mean, I still believe in Wiseman as long as his knee keeps him at a hundred percent, and you know, it's just a meniscus, and people come back from those all the time. Uh, I, I would not give up on on all of that. I think you can still. Um, add players and uh, and compete for a, for a title, you know. Because to me, it's not like oh, we need to to make it for sure that we are like the favorites and we're gonna win it like dynasty days, you know. Like that's not gonna happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think you have to be a little bit wiser about. It. And also, like the injury that um, Siakam has, it's a big deal to me because you know if Clay's not back for a while and he's not back for a while. You're digging yourself into a hole in the standings, most yeah. likely. Like a, a then you have the same team that you ended the season with. 
Exactly. You, you have the, yeah, you have the team you you lost to Memphis with. <laughs> yeah. And like wouldn't you rather have just you know more depth, more youth, more scoring? <laughs> I think I think if they do this wisely then they have a, a pretty solid window. Steph may not be MVP Steph like in two seasons, but he Clay and Draymond sure as hell will be effective as hell. And yeah. um, I just think like all these knee jerk reactions of, of win now. I mean, you know, there's there's two types of fans, right? Like if I could just generalize, like there's the ones uh, who like to like, build and like to see uh, the growth and be good and the plan uh, for the future and how they can proceed because we don't want to just go back to the dark ages. And then there's like the randoms. <laughs> the casuals who were like, I want to see the best team I can see on the floor. Yeah. I want to like yeah. win a championship. And like, I mean, maybe they're not all casuals, but there's just a certain type where like, they want to see like all or nothing. And I'm just not that kind of guy, you know, <laughs> like I don't, yeah. Yeah. I don't want to see that. I think there's ways that they can obviously compete and you're going to have to deal with like uh, the age of these guys soon. And I, I don't think giving up these assets for an injured Siakam is it. If, um, yeah. if there's somebody else, then maybe, you know, I'm, I'm not that tied to it, but like, I just don't uh, think it's him. And um, like you said, if they throw in uh, the the number four pick and we get like Suggs, Green, or Barnes, then I'm like, great, you know, it's a whole another story. The way I look at it is that this next season is still going to be a transitional year. Um, and maybe... Uh, maybe by the end of this next season they've all kind of like converged into like being a real threat, but I don't, I don't see them. I, I mean, I think I'm looking at them being uh, a, a real contender over the next two or three years. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that like, again, Clay's a real keystone to this, uh, but let's say he's 85% of what he was. Uh, Draymond is still going to be a, uh, a beast on defense and these young players that you are building depth with um, uh, are, are on an accelerated development path. And maybe by year two, you see kind of like an Atlanta Hawks situation, except yeah. instead of, you know, in, but except you already have battle tested veterans already there. So like, imagine those like young Hawks with like, our big three, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I think that is a possibility, you know? And then that is definitely the dual timeline that that they've really desired. I think mm -hmm. that's the dual timeline we all desire, you know, yeah. not just yeah. the Warriors organization. And, and, you know, there's a certain romance for us as Warriors fans about the draft. I mean, I guess any, any fandom, but uh, about the, the development and the homegrown nature of that. And that is, that is more fun in a way. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. uh, like I'd love to see that dual timeline. That would be amazing. So yeah. I, I think, and I think it's possible. And and that's also why I think that they're going to keep these picks unless something and blows them away, which I don't, I think, I think they think it's possible too. That's why they brought in these three coaches, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, so it's like, oh, we didn't do this well with it last year. We need to work on development for the future. So why not uh, now? Um, let me ask you this. If if Scotty Barnes, he won't fall to this uh, uh, six, but if he did, would you trade both picks for, uh, to get Scotty Barnes? Can I get a second round pick? <laughs> <laughs> and take DJ Boston? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I'll do it. I'll do it if you throw in a second round pick. I I, I got my eye on some of these uh these late round you know, these second rounders. So you wouldn't do it uh, just straight up for, for Barnes for at six? I I think I think I would. I think I would. I do like him quite a bit. I yeah. do think he's gonna be pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I like a week ago I was unflinchingly like, oh yeah. Yeah, I do that trade. And But to like, six? Uh, I, I'm, okay, I'll I'll do it if I get a second round. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a second rounder, so you get BJ Boston. But like um I'm I'm a little less uh hundred percent on it 
largely because I've, you know, studied up more on these other dudes and I'm like, oh, wow, these guys could be pretty good, you know, but I feel like Barnes could actually help right away. And uh, I don't think his shot is that bad, but no, um, no. you know, uh, I, I probably would do it. I mean, I would do it if Kaminga fell to six, but I know the Warriors wouldn't because that would just be, they would get shredded by a lot of people locally nationally maybe not but like locally uh the optics of that would be bad i would want to trade up for for barnes i think i think last week i was like 100 percent yes i think today i'm like eh, 70 or 80 percent. how about this what if suggs fell to five or six would you trade seven and 14 for him absolutely Absolutely. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I would totally uh, trade up for, for him because I think he could help now. And while he might not be the scorer um, at that maybe a book night is, uh, I think like, yeah, I'll, I'll pass on, you know, the, the big swing with <laughs> my man, Zyra Williams uh, to take, <laughs> you know, Jalen Suggs, who is just as young and is both helped now and has a pretty high ceiling and seeing him again if you want to think timelines in the future like i will take a <laughs> a lineup of uh Suggs, um pool and wiseman as like your building blocks sorry nico Mannion, but <laughs> you know three you guard know. lineup <laughs> yeah <laughs> nobody over six four um <laughs> uh so that that it would be uh enticing to me but you know like the more i've looked at these dudes who are in the 7 to 14 range i would be happy with book knight i i, I would be happy with yeah. williams and i think i think just now talking about it i've become really fixated on those two dudes you know like moody was up there for me at 14 the idea of taking like a, a ready-made dude at 14 like mitchell was up there in a way sometimes I could mix make that make sense to me but um I would love book Knight and Zaria Williams but if you end up with like say book Knight and and Davion Mitchell I mean hey you got like a backcourt just coming in um yeah. that could again probably not in the postseason but at least in the regular season give you hopefully positive minutes eventually it's gonna be exciting this is always the best time of year yeah 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 we're gonna we're gonna have to do a mock draft no <laughs> oh i'm 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 down for that i'm down for that. you mean like where like you put on a houston gm uh hat and be like we should do one where like everybody picks. just trades <laughs> like, <laughs> detroit we have a trade houston we have a trade cleveland we have a trade they've all traded their picks to the warriors for second round picks <laughs> <laughs> for michael Mulder and alan smiley all right. Well, that is that was like a, a marathon episode of the Oakland Warriors podcast. Uh, be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, check us out at OaklandWarriors.com. Hit me up on Twitter at Oakland Warriors. And be sure to tell your fellow Warrior fan friends to tune in and listen. The Oakland Warriors podcast is produced by National Film Society. That's it. Music in this episode provided by Paper Sun. Special thanks to Paul Amardo for production support. See you next time.